I know that everybody, when they start, start out their Bible reading, they'll usually say it's pretty difficult to understand. So that's the purpose of this class. This purpose is to show you that the Bible is actually not hard, but very easy to understand. And that is done uh, through constant reading and studying of the scriptures. So that's what this class is for. It's to help you launch in that. So pay attention to how I explain every word. That way you can uh, see and check for yourself if the explanation matches up rightly. That's one, because I could be teaching you something false, you know. And number two, the thing is, is that once you have a common sense gist of how I'm explaining the words, it's going to hit your mind. And then when you do your own Bible reading and when you read it, you're going to go, oh, OK, so I get the gist now. So then you'll be able to understand the Bible yourself when you read it. All right. So try to pay attention as I do all that. All right. Let's open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter two, please. So we covered all the deep doctrines last time. And there is one more deep doctrine that I do want to get into. So first of all, we left off at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. So we might recall that we left off at verse 17. And the Bible talks about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And for some of you who weren't there at the last Bible study, we mentioned that it is uh, what the Bible calls a vine tree. So the fruit that Adam and Eve ate at the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is uh, our grapes, grapes. And some people say, well, I, there's, grapes don't grow on trees. But the idea is if you look at the Bible, the, there is a word called the vine tree, the vine tree. The Bible words it that way. So it could be where the grapes are growing on a vine, but it's wrapping around some tree which is what I mentioned in our Genesis study that that can be possibly the case. If we keep that in mind, then go back to, uh, go to Ezekiel 31, please. Now keep your hand at Genesis 2, and we'll go to Ezekiel 31. So in Genesis 2, 17, which is where we're leaving off at, God warned them, and I'm not going to explain every word in that one because I did it last time. God warned them that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. So as sure as you live and breathe, it's going to be clearly death. If you eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, chew on that grape and then you will die spiritually. It's not physical, but it's spiritual. Now, why would there be death accompanied to this tree? Now, it, I showed you in the previous Genesis study that it is connected to Satan somehow. So I'm not going to do that over here too much. But I showed you how it's somehow connected to Satan in some way or form. I don't know exactly, but the Bible attributes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to Satan. Realizing this fact that somehow the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is connected to Satan... Notice what the devil is called. He is called a certain type of tree at the Garden of Eden. Now, remember I mentioned to you that it is a, it, the, uh, the forbidden fruit is grapes, but there's no such thing as a grape uh, tree. So then I mentioned the possibility, remember, it could be growing on a vine that's wrapping around some tree. If that's the case, then it could be the cedar tree. All right, so the tree could be cedar, and then God could have had the vine growing around this tree. You might say, really? Yeah, go back to Ezekiel 31, which we read last time. I don't know if you caught this. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 31. Now, notice the wording here which we read last time, we know this is Satan. We know this is Satan at verse 7. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Look at verse 9. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that, look at this, all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So we know this is talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And we know, as we read this passage last time, that's referring to Lucifer and Satan. Now, onliners, I know that you're going to ask me what's the passage for that. So, like I said many times, I've done then the last Genesis study, so I can't do that. So you need to go to our Genesis videos. Uh, just go backwards, and it's in a series, and then you'll see that. Now, look at verse 8, though. Look at this one. The cedars, see that? In the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Now, did you notice that? Look at verse 3. It's t the Bible calls him the Assyrian. Look at verse 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature and his top was like, uh, and his top was among the thick boughs. So notice here that this is the cedar tree at the Garden of Eden, but then the fruit is grapes. So then the solution is simple. So usually when you see so-called problems or contradictions in the Bible, like I told you, it's just showing you a greater, more interesting revelation, right? Some people say, oh, it's not a vine tree. Where you get that from? And uh, grapes don't grow on trees. Well, scripture with scripture shows that contradiction to be a greater enlightenment. So, yeah, uh, grapes don't grow on trees. It's going on a vine, but this vine could be wrapping around the cedar tree. So think about that one. But here's another interesting notion to think about. So this is just food for thought. If you look at the wording here, the wording is, is this tree is like reaching all the way to the top. Now, the Bible mentions one king likened to that, and that's Nebuchadnezzar, where it reaches up to the heavens. Go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 5, please. Uh, Daniel chapter 4, please. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, and look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream that he was likened to this tall tree that reached all the way up to the heaven, representing his kingdom spreading throughout all the earth. Now, who is the one that gave Nebuchadnezzar charge over the kingdom to spread throughout all the, over the earth? It's the devil. He had the power and the authority to give it to whomsoever he will. Like you'll notice that Matthew chapter 4. So look at the wording here. Look at verse 11. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. So the tree that Nebuchadnezzar was likened to was a tree whose height reached to the heaven that far. Some of the wording here is pretty similar with Ezekiel 31 about being a tall tree. It doesn't mention about being as tall that reached up to heaven, but there's no, room, there's, uh, there's no room to really doubt it either because the wording is similar, so why not that the tree in Ezekiel 31, the height was so great and tall that it reached up to the heavens. If that be the case, think about this. So this is all just theory, but it's, it is interesting food for thought to understanding the pattern of the devil. This is in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, Babylon is a kingdom that revived from the ancient ruins where it originated from Babel. Babel, they built a tower that would reach all the way up to where? The heaven. That's their goal. What were they trying to accomplish? Why was the devil behind it? Why did God stop it? And Satan is likened to what? A tree that's height grows very, very tall. But what does Satan say? Satan had the same mentality as the people who built the Tower of Babel. What did he say at Isaiah 14? I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will reach above the stars of God. I'm going to reach the sides of the north. There's something strange and something interesting about this. So if we look at mankind today, how they're always trying to reach and go up, you got to realize that that's not really a good thing. There's something, uh, there's something strange and demonic behind the activity. 
And I can say this, I can say there's a large number, so let's give the benefit of the doubt, large number of scientists who have good intentions. They want to benefit humanity. But that's the same thing with the people at the Tower of Babel. They're trying to reach up to the heaven because they're thinking, I'm doing this for humanity's sake. But they have no idea that they're just puppets on the string controlled by the wicked one to accomplish a more uh, evil feat. All right, go back to Genesis. And turning to Genesis chapter 2. So this is interesting. It could be that this tree was, as i drawn, drawn it here in this picture, it's trying to go for the top. It's trying to go for the top. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 18. And the Lord God said, so the Lord God himself is speaking. What did he say here? All right, men, can I get an amen? Not you single men, all right? It is not good that the man should be alone. Amen. All right, I will make him and help me for him. Your time will come, brother. Your time will come, all right? Your time will come. Right. So it says that God said, it's not good that man should be alone. That is important. And I want people who come to this church and onliners understand this. They really don't understand this. The Lord, he does not like it when mankind is alone. A person, you'll notice that the Lord doesn't really approve of that. A person being alone and solitary, God says it is not good. A lot of people might justify about being a hermit on the mountains or they don't need to go to church. Uh, they don't need to get involved with people. Uh, it's just Jesus and me. It's fine. I can be all by myself. But God knows this is that it's not good for them to be alone. Now, trust me, if the Lord gave you a special calling to be alone and there are missionaries who suffered loneliness out in the mission field, <laughs> Guess what? The Lord will give it to you. You don't have to make that yourself. Because naturally, humans should not be alone. That's how the Lord operated it. Let the Lord make you alone, okay? And trust me, when you're a Bible-believing Christian, it's easy to become alone. <laughs> the whole world hates you. Everyone separates from you. You're the only one standing up for Jesus, and it's very difficult to serve God. So... If you have every opportunity not to be alone, you should take that advantage. It's not good. The Lord doesn't like that. Why? Because it's a, go to Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10. Even scientifically speaking, scientifically speaking, psychologists know that when man is alone, that they're not able to function to their best. And babies, I mean, this is all the way from birth. You do not leave a baby alone. The body and mind is not built like that. The body and mind is built where it is dependent, where it relies, where it needs proper functioning and help from other people. Now, look, if you think that you can do it by yourself, then you got to realize this, and you have a lot of pride, and the Lord doesn't like that. See that? I mean, no matter how strong you are, you got to humble yourself and realize, look, I'm, as, I'm capable to sin. I'm capable to mess up. I'm capable of being weak, and I need somebody to help me serve God. Now, look, like I told you before, sometimes the Lord gives a special calling where you do suffer loneliness. I mean, every church starts out with, to be quite honest, loneliness. But if you have two or even three people, that's not really alone. But the idea is, is that, Usually we start our ministries uh, being alone. So God gives special grace, special strength, and a special calling to these people. But it's not normal, you have to understand. As Christians, as the body of Christ, as a group of believers, God knows it's normal that they have to be together to support each other. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Notice the wording, not forsaking. That's a strong word. That's like abandonment like you do with the baby, right, if you leave it alone? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. When do we assemble as believers? Not just a Sunday service where you wear a suit and a tie and then you act all holy and religious and after service is over, you all go eat out in a buffet and then you sin at Monday morning, right? So that's whenever we assemble, God wants us to be together even if it's just a small little fellowship with just three people. Notice right here, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. See that? 
because there's an exhortation of each other. We encourage each other. We support each other. And so much the more. Ah, look at that. God wants you to do even not just be together, but to do more than that together. God wants you to do even more. And so much the more. Why is that? Because look at that word, and I'm sure you all can agree with this, as ye see the what? Day approaching. All right, so a person should not be alone. It's good to be together, and you've got to do it even more. Why is that? Because the day's approaching. I mean, look at today's current events. You're telling me that the day is not approaching? Like the end is coming. So I can't tell you it's going to happen tomorrow, next year, or for all I know, it could be years later. But the point is, is that we are getting closer, no matter how far away we are from the rapture. The point is we are closer today than we were the past years. And we're getting closer and closer. And as times get more tough, you need to be together. Onliners, you need to do that, which is why we started an RBB Connect group. Uh, that's why we told you if you have a Bible-believing church that you can drive to, you need to attend that kind of a church. People here, you need to come. Look, I know what it's like driving more than an hour. I was working full-time in community college while pastoring a church, while attempting to be the first person to come inside the church and had to go through five hours all the way from Santa Monica up to Cathedral City, Palm Springs during traffic hour of Southern California. All right, and you know that's like one of the worst places in the world to be at <laughs> for traffic. So I know what it's like, but let me tell you, if I didn't keep going, I would have fallen away. I needed, I don't know about you, you're probably spiritually stronger than me, but I'll tell you what, I needed church. You know what? And I'm not the one enjoying the teaching and preaching. But just speaking from the word of God and being with people about the word of God keeps me going on the right path. Yeah. Not make me feel backslidden, feel like I'm not progressing as much. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 2. So you thought I was going to talk about the wife. <laughs> but the idea here is that it, they shouldn't be alone. The intention was not, know this, the Lord's intention was not a woman here when he said that statement. Why is that? Because notice the Lord didn't provide Eve immediately. All the Lord thought about is it's not good that man should be alone. The person uh, needs a helper to be by his side. Because notice God said, I will make him and help meet for him. So God wants to Give him a help meet. In other words, a person that will meet his needs and be a helper to him. Now, who fulfills that role? Nowadays, women despise that role. Now, you got to realize this, women, that the Lord could have picked a lot of other uh, creations rather than you. But he gave you to fulfill that role. When God gives you a special purpose and calling, don't you dare belittle it and call it like it's abusive. I just have to be a, a person in the home and then taking care of babies and uh, cooking food and then chores in the house. And when you belittle God's role to you, then the Lord, don't, the Lord gives you free choice to fully reject that. And then you can live a miserable life and he'll, have a, he'll find somebody else to fulfill that role. Because look what would have filled in the role. The Lord didn't do a woman to begin with. He was trying to find something to help the man to meet his needs. Look at verse 19. That's the key. That's why verse 18, the point is true. The idea is not about wife. The idea is that basically man should not be alone. That's the bottom line. That's why we should meet together. That's why we should have church. That's the point of that verse. Not a woman. The woman... She fulfills that role. She fulfills that role that the Lord used. But the idea and the purpose of this verse was not about a woman. It was about finding somebody out there or some kind of creation to take care of the man. And then it just so happened that you women fulfill that role, which is why this verse, we quite use it often for the women and men when they marry. But... 
uh, you know, the, uh, if you women didn't exist, the Lord could have done just fine to leave verse 18 alone. All right. So that's why don't take your role lightly. Verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. So God, uh, out of the ground, the earth, the Lord created animals. See that? He formed them, shaped the beasts of the field and every fowl of the air. So it seems like that the birds came out of the ground and were created too for birds that fly in the air. Now it came from the ground. If it came from the ground here, then it could be what we stated. Remember, Adam was in a golden ground area pretty much. So if that the, that's the case, these animals may have had a glow and a shine too when they were created. So that could have been the case as well. I mean, it would make some sense if uh, the Lord practically makes all of heaven gold, including the ground itself, pure gold, he says, in heaven. Streets of pure gold. So it could make some sense, perhaps. Okay, but anyways, let's uh, keep reading. So then he creates every animal that he could uh, find to help the man through his lowliness. So if that's the case, keep reading on, and brought them unto Adam. So God brought these animals after he created from the ground. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So then God wanted to see what name Adam would call them. So notice here that God did not give the name to the animals. Mankind, God gave them. Uh, the, uh, God gave them the choice to name the animals. Let's keep reading. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature. So any living creature that he could find that God created, right? Whatsoever God, uh, not God, excuse me, whatsoever Adam called. So whatever Adam gave the name to these creatures, that was the name thereof at verse 19. So that became their name. And Adam gave names to all cattle. So God, uh, Adam, he provided every name to every form of cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every bird that flies in the air, and to every beast of the field. So every beast, every creature, every animal that roams around the fields, the ground. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. However, despite of all these animals the Lord created that Adam named, there was, uh, Adam could not find a proper suitable role out of God's creation, any of these beings or creatures that could be a help meet, meet his need and help him out. So in verse 19 and 20, we know, uh, I mentioned it in our last Bible study in Genesis that Adam had to give the name of all these creatures. But remember, uh, the Bible talks about man was created on the sixth day. And when the Bible talks about man being created on the sixth day, all of a sudden it just mentions about man and woman. So if all of this happened within the sixth day and Eve was not created yet when Adam gave all the names to the animals, you got to realize this, Adam was like a supercomputer then. So then he was able to name all these animals just like this. That's a, that's a powerful mind that the Lord blessed Adam during... Uh, before his fallen state. Imagine how powerful our minds will be when we are delivered from our fallen state and have a body and a creation that's better than even Adam's. You know, the Bible says we have the mind of Jesus Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So that's something. That's something there. So it could be, so I'm going to say it could be, that Adam gave the name to all these animals within uh, less than 24 hours. It may be. Now, if that's the case at verse 19 and 20, 19 and 20 is good. Okay, this is where you singles could probably say amen unless you don't have a pet. But the idea is, I don't know if you notice this. So notice that the Bible is way ahead and predicts the human nature very well. Human nature, when they're alone... And, you know, if you don't have a, a partner for yourself, then what do lonely people tend to do? They have pets. They have animals. Guess what? Even hermits do. Even hermits do. You know why? Because it is human nature. It's not good for a man to be alone. See, that is proven true. That is proven true. So when the Lord provided uh, pets, 
Oh, I, you know what, I'm not going to draw a pet right now because uh, I'm not going to do that, all right? Then it's going to take so much time on the board. But the point is, is that when we're uh, feeling alone, it is natural that people buy pets so that it can fulfill the loneliness. But guess what? Nothing tops off when the Lord provides you the significant other, right? Nothing tops that one when the Lord provides a significant other. No matter how, many you, how much you try to fulfill the loneliness. And the Lord, what did he do? Verse 21. And the Lord God, so obviously that's God himself. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. So God, he caused a deep sleep to just fall upon Adam. So Adam was falling into a deep sleep. And he slept. So Adam slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So notice the wording here. God took one of Adam's ribs. So Adam had more than just one rib. The Bible calls it ribs. And when he took out one of his ribs, the Bible says he closed up the body instead thereof. So then the Lord closed up the body afterwards. So then this is fascinating. Like, you notice here that Genesis 1 and 2 is filled with so many scientific statements that if mankind followed the, and abided by the first two chapters, they would have had a, a healthy physical life and, good, and a good mental well-being. Because the Lord talked about loneliness here. It predicted about human psychology here. And then it also talked about at chapter 1 about... Uh, how, uh, you know, chapter one and chapter two about the animal system and the plant system. We've seen all of that. But another amazing thing here that you want to mark down about your Bible is if people abided by verse 21 through 22, it could have saved a lot of people from pain during surgery. Notice the Lord was do doing a surgery here. You might say, what kind of a surgery? Well, he was doing a surgery within Adam that basically he knew that in order to take out something from his body, right? You know, uh, notice that he closed up the flesh thereof, right? So the Bible shows that the Lord, he had to slice a hole within Adam's body and then take out one of his ribs. During surgery, you'll notice that medical doctors do procedures that are pretty similar to that. So then, uh, how is that possible that God could do that without Adam feeling pain. You, he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. So notice here that the Lord, he knows that from mankind, from Adam here, that he is able to perform surgery and be able to create a woman for the man through the medical procedure of putting him to sleep. That's amazing about your God. So that's amazing about your God. So the Lord, he knows what he's doing. And if mankind just followed the pattern that the Lord did things, then we could have scientifically progressed, actually. Okay. Now, returning to the main text here. We're wondering about which rib is it? That's our question. We believe that it's the fifth rib. Look at verse 22. And the rib which, which the Lord God had taken from man. So the Lord took one specific rib from Adam. He took it from uh, man. Made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So notice that the Lord just took the rib and made a woman and then brought the woman to Adam, to the man. So if we see this text here, this is the key to find out which rib it is. How to find out which rib is, it's a woman and it's a rib. That's the point here. It's a woman and it's a rib. Now, when we look at the relationship of a woman and a man throughout the scriptures, then we can guess which part of the body from the man that the woman would come from. Now, we're going to look at the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, please. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Why do we believe it's the fifth rib?
because the Bible only, the only mention you can find in the Bible concerning about the rib, a specific rib, a specific rib is fifth rib. There's no other number. There is no other number the Lord gives it. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. So that's clue number one. Clue number one, and I want you to look at this skull symbol too because it's all going to connect here. So let me erase here a bit. One is that there's only uh, a the only specific mention of the rib in the Bible is fifth rib. There's no other number or other specific. And fifth rib is mentioned as the most uh, mentioned rib throughout the Bible than any other ribs. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, 2 Samuel, I said first, 2 Samuel, excuse me, yeah. 2 Samuel 2, excuse me. I apologize for that one. Notice that how this person died. And that's the second clue. The second clue is death. When the Bible talks about fifth rib, it always associates it with death here from this picture. Now, look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. And then notice what the Bible says. At verse 23, Howbeit he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner with the hinder end of the spear smote him under the what? Fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. So he automatically died at that spot. Let's also look at 2 Samuel chapter 20. 2 Samuel chapter 20. Notice that quite often fifth rib is connected to death. 2 Samuel chapter 20, and we will read verse 10, verse 10. Now, remember, because of Adam, we all die. But remember, who was the person that caused Adam to die? It's a woman. It's a woman. So notice here that we see all of this connected to what? Eve. So Eve's uh, basically... The devil tempted Eve first. Why? Because in order for death to reign throughout all of Adam, he had to use Eve to accomplish his means of death. So notice that Eve is also connected to that. Her, her role, Eve's actions. So that's the third clue here. 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 10. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he smote him, him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. So he died again. Now, here's another one. Look at the book of John. Look at the book of John. Now remember that in order to make sure that a person is dead, in order to make sure that a person is dead, you have to smite him at the fifth rib, right? We looked at one of the passages, a way to make sure that the person is dead is to strike a spear under the fifth rib. Now, if you're using your head, which being or person in the Bible had a spear thrust to his side? Why? To make sure that he was truly dead. Jesus Christ, look at John 19. John 19. And then we're going to look at verse 34 through 36. 34 through 36. And then your hand is already at Genesis 2 because the wording here is going to be very important that I want you to know. Notice the wording here. John chapter 19, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Why? To make sure he was dead. Uh, verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side. See that? The wording there shows that uh, they wanted to make sure that Jesus was truly dead. That's why they thrust a spear into his side. Now, they, when they did this, this was done to fulfill scripture. Why? That Jesus' bone will 
not be broken. So in other words, if you do something with the fifth rib or in that location, the bones should be held intact and it should be safe. Because uh, look at verse uh, 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. So Jesus' bone was not broken when, when, there, was a in, uh, when there was a cutting or a stabbing at the fifth rib. Now think about this. That's why the Lord chose the fifth rib from Adam. Why? So his bones can be held intact. Genesis 2, what did Adam say? Genesis 2, verse 23. Genesis 2, 23. And Adam said, so what did Adam say? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. See that? Adam uh, likened Eve to being bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. See, Adam's bones were held intact. It was held intact. So we're seeing a lot of interesting things here. Now go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Now, notice what the Bible says here. If we see that from Jesus' example, that's another thing. From the case of Jesus, that in order to make sure of death, that's where it was struck on the fifth rib to make sure that the job was done. You know what the Bible did? The Bible combined the case of Jesus and the wife with Adam and his wife together, if that's not enough. See, these are all tied together. Look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Notice what the Bible says at verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Isn't that similar to the wording with Adam and Eve? But if that's not enough, this is more plain. Verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Where did Paul get that verse from? He got it from Genesis 2, Adam and Eve. He, he was thinking about Adam and Eve. He was talking about Adam and, Adam and Eve. Go to Genesis 2 again. Notice what Adam said at verse 24. If you look at verse 24, notice that the writer of Genesis said this, if it was an Adam. Look at verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Like practically word for word, almost. So notice here that Paul had that in mind when he was writing Ephesians 5. Returning to Ephesians 5 now, notice that the passage, knowing that this is talking about Adam and Eve, notice the relationship is what? The relationship is, notice at verse 32, the next verse, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? Christ and the church. He likens the relationship of husband and wife to Christ and the church. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See that relationship? Now, here's another thing. Another thing is, if he was smote at the fifth rib, the location itself, see that? The location of this fifth rib is near the heart. Now, they say that when Jesus died on the cross, he died of a broken heart for you. If you look at the word death, quite often it is associated with love when Jesus died on the cross. If you look at the theme of movies, it's always love and death. In other words, Satan distorted it to sex and violence. If you look at Adam and Eve's case even, Adam died, why? Out of love for Eve. Look at the book of Timothy. Look at the book of Timothy. Adam chose to die. He wasn't deceived. He wasn't tricked. He knew full well what he was doing. But because he loved his wife Eve, he chose to die along with her. We're going to look at uh, the book of 
uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 13, verse 13. Notice the Bible says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. See that? He wasn't the one tricked. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So notice here that Adam was not tricked into do, doing this. He knew full well what he was involving himself with. Then why did he choose to do that? Because he loved Eve. He loved Eve. Notice that, uh, what did Adam say at Genesis 3? The woman that you gave to me gave me the fruit and then I ate. Why was he like blaming God about the woman? Because the woman was someone he was willing to die for, to pay the price. Men are stupid people sometimes, ladies. I realize that. Yeah. But you just don't realize how stupid they can be because they just love you that much that they'll do the most stupid things for you sometimes. Yeah. All right. Some of you wives are like saying, my husband don't do that. I wish he would. You know, why won't he do that? You know, uh, that's between uh, your relationship and God. All right. I have nothing to do with that. If you're interested in counseling, you can talk to me after church. Go back to Genesis 2. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Yeah, hey amen, brother. Look like you need help. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2. And then uh, we'll look at verse 22 through 23. So seeing all these cases together, we can see that it was from the fifth rib. Verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones. So we, I explained that word for word. Now the next part, and flesh of my flesh, because the woman came from Adam's flesh and body. Remember, the Bible says at verse 21, God closed the flesh thereof. That's so much like surgery. You're opening up a body, getting something out of there, and then you're, uh, getting in, uh, you're attaching the body back together again. It's just so amazing. You see so much of science here. Uh, Reading onwards, she shall be called, notice, woman. You see that there? Woman. So you ladies are called woman. And that's something that you should be thankful to the Lord. Now, why are you called woman? N notice how uh, I'm going to be very politically incorrect here. And some of you are probably going to walk out, af uh, out of church after this. Notice the wording here. Why you, uh, your name exists. It's because of the man. Notice here, she shall be called woman. Why? Why? Because she was taken out of man. See that? So it's because you women are from the man. That's why you're called woman. Uh, notice all the, uh, how you're identified. There's female. Why? From male. Woman. From what? The man. And this becomes very politically incorrect, which is why uh, we're getting the feminist movement where they're, they want to change it. In weddings and marriages, it's normal. You, whose last name that you take after you get married, right? So you notice here, woman, their title exists, their name exists from the man himself. And that's what... Uh, the liberal movement hates. The liberal movement hates that because they want women to be independent and to be their own person. So then they try to do that. They try to do that. I, I, I even think the idiot who said, a ah, woman, at, the, <laughs> at our government, the idiot don't realize how discriminatory that person was. So he was trying to be, you know, I'm trying to make it equalized for the women and the men, you know, because the women don't have their place. He don't realize how many times he said woman, 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 and that he's not giving them an equality. So, you know, I can, I know the mindset of some of these liberal scholars. I know exactly how to catch them in their hypocrisy and give a sensitive complaint and say, you were racist right here. You were discriminatory right here. Blah, 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 man. If... Notice by living that way, you can't function properly as a human. I mean, we live in a day and age, you're just careful on what to say because you don't want to say something politically incorrect. And people are more careful with their words in offending somebody concerning racism, discrimination, but they're not more careful with their words concerning about offending God by taking his name in vain. That's something to me. That is something. You are something else, man, you hypocrite. 
All right. Do you know how, uh, how much you offended God by taking his name in vain? That's like worse than 10 N-words combined, you don't realize. Because you're talking about the creator of the universe there. And if people, if people just get so careful and they get so shocked and they'll even slap their kid or yell at them, don't you dare say that word concerning about different minorities where it could be racially offensive. It is so mind-boggling. They don't do that with their children concerning God's name in vain. Why don't you yell at your kid when they do that and then be strict with them? Oh, no, but they'll call you abusive, huh? Or you're being too serious. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. You. Don't make me preach 30 minutes against these, bun these bunch of hypocrites and fools. I do, not like about, I do not like this wicked movement. If you're part of that wicked movement, you better open up your eyes and look at the scriptures. You don't read that much Bible. All right, go back to Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now, looking at verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. So because the woman is taken out of the man, what's the result? Mankind, they can leave now their father and mother so they don't have to be dependent on them anymore. They leave. They become their own man. Why? And shall cleave unto his wife. Because you're not clinging, clinging on to, depending on your parents you're now cleaving. So that's as if you're becoming one, the idea. Clinging so much to a point that you're becoming one. You cleave unto the wife. Now it's you two. You're out in your own world. You have to depend upon each other. You can't just depend upon mommy and daddy, obviously. It's you two. You two make the decision in your family, in your home, not your parents. Do you understand that? So I understand that mindset. I come from a cultural background where we respect and honor our elders. So uh, I'm not saying to dishonor the parents. We should honor them. And you better realize no matter how old you are, you can't underestimate the counsel of the elderly. So I don't deny that. However, what I'm talking about is you can't depend so much on them that you're not using your own independent thought independent decisions and yes even independent decisions that can conflict with the elderly and you can still honor them and disagree with them you can still honor them but when it's between you and God you're gonna have to realize I have to disagree with them and at times you have to realize that why because you're maturing now you're maturing into developing the wisdom God has been teaching you and you have to make smart decisions for yourself not let somebody else do it for you so by doing that, you're a family together, and they shall be one flesh. So notice that the Bible says that this one is considered to be one flesh. Male and female. It's an amazing thing how the Lord did it with uh, man and woman, one of God's best creations. Now, some people wonder how, uh, what is marriage, how is marriage defined and started in the Bible and this is the verse. The verse shows that at verse 24, that's where you're considered husband and wife, is notice when you become one flesh. So that's the idea, is that when uh, basically through a sexual encounter, God automatically sees that as marriage. Now some of you might be in shell shock mode, and you know, God forbid that 90% of you had done premarital sex. But that's common now. 99% of people have done fornication. It's become that normal, except probably your children who are raised in a Christian home. But it's so sad nowadays that um, we live in a day and age where people just fornicate with each other before marriage. And by doing that, you got to realize then how many people you slept with and how many marriages and divorces that you practically did. Oh, what's wrong with fornication? I'll tell you what's wrong with fornication. You're not sticking to that person because God considers when one body starts to interact with the other body, it's automatically becoming one and God sees that as something, guess what? You don't realize this, sacred and holy. So uh, some of you have been there in my teaching concerning about sex, but sex is not supposed to be something filthy. 
You know what made it filthy? The world. Because they feel like you can just become one all the stinking time. And then the dark imagination just runs in a creative mode and then just gets into worse stuff. But it's supposed to be sacred and holy. You don't know that? I mean, look at the book of Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. It's supposed to be sacred and holy. Taking something sacred and holy and turning it into something filthy, you, you're in trouble. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. That's why we take fornication seriously. You think that we're just being tight people and, you know, oh, you think you're holier than thou and you're better than us and uh, blah, blah, blah. Look, man, I mean, you, I don't care how you make fun of me on that one. I mean, the Lord takes it that seriously. That's the reason why our church takes this thing seriously. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says concerning about uh, marriage. If we look at verse 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. See that? It's holy. But whoremongers and adulterers, what? God will judge. God takes that seriously. All right, going back to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. So the idea is, is that when uh, both bodies become one, that's considered marriage. So this is the reason why it is very, very important that when you do marriage, that you have to do it in biblical terms, biblical terms. Now, some people take this as an excuse that, oh, so that's right, pastor, so I don't have to do things legally. No, you should do things legally. You know why? Because uh, even though the rules were not in place during Adam and Eve's time, you got to realize this. God wants us to follow the rules of the government. He wants us to do things legally, not illegally, unless obviously if it makes us uh, violate and sin. By that point, then we have to ch choose to obey God rather than men. So we have to do things legally. So, I mean, it, do you really think it's a good testimony as a Christian to just uh, go off away, run away to Las Vegas, and then just come back? What do you think Christians in church will feel? And even lost people. This is too fast. You're being irresponsible. There aren't other people who approve of this and are just wondering, you know, is, uh, are you just doing this at the spur of the moment? See that? So you already ruin your Christian testimony, and God's not going to be behind that. No matter how much you justify in using Genesis 2, well, when two bodies become one, we're married. You know, by doing that, the Lord does not want you to be married in a way that is illegal, that is a bad testimony as a Christian. Are you telling me that? You can do things out of Scripture, but do things that are not scriptural. Do you know that? Here's a good example. Jesus Christ whipped people at the marketplace because they turned his temple, uh, the Lord's house, into a merchandise place. I mean, that's scriptural. So then you think that God would approve of you taking out a whip and beating up people in Catholic churches and Masonic lodges, you know? Might be ideal to the Lord, but no, you know? Why? You ruin your testimony. Why? We think you're cuckoo. People, because in the eyes of common sense people, you're cuckoo, you're strange, and you're all that. Now, you got to realize this also. People in Catholic churches, Masonic lodges, and even Baptist churches, yes, of our denomination, they don't know right doctrine. And a lot of them are more sincere people than you are. you got to realize this. So because of that notion, by just simply beating up people at a marketplace, you have no idea how many uh, people you may have injured who may have been a better person being more religious and doing more good works than you are. See, you don't count the cost. See, you don't count the cost. So the important thing is, I think some of you might know this when you come to our church, is that we're not a matter about religion or denomination. We're a matter of scripture. And we don't care which background or religion you're from. If you contradict the Bible, then wrong is wrong. That's why we're known to be an independent Baptist church, right? Why? Because the Baptist denomination is pretty obvious through Beth Moore and all the other people. They've fallen deep down into apostasy. If you want, to, uh, what's the purpose of coming to church to be a Bible believer? Because you want the truth. Not something that's religiously or politically correct. But you want the truth. If you have that in your heart, trust me, what's going to happen is 
then the Lord's going to show you more things on what's true and what's false. And then if you keep that in your heart, then the Lord can change your life into a much better person. Amen. You cannot serve God well without truth as a foundation. Because living your life in a lie is not a real life to serve the Lord. All right, returning back to Genesis chapter 2, and then uh, we'll read verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife. So man and woman, they're both naked and were not ashamed. So notice that they were not ashamed in being naked. You might say, why is that? It, the reason why is because they were at the stage of innocence. Innocence. Notice that the tree they ate was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They knew what was right and wrong. They didn't have that knowledge set up yet. Why is that? Because they were at the stage of, you know which age or mindset that has that, right? Basically, uh, little children or even babies. Because, you know, they just run around naked, giggling and laughing, <laughs> you know, like that. And then you're basically the tree of knowledge of good and evil telling them, no, you don't do that here, all right? There's something embarrassing about that. So that kind of mindset set is the stage of innocence. So God wanted them to maintain a stage of innocence so that they don't get exposed to evil. They don't get exposed to evil. They don't experience or delve into evil itself. A lot of, like I told you before, a lot of professors are saying, you know, God wanted them to be dumb. God didn't want them to increase and grow in knowledge. No, it's because God was trying to save them from a lot of heartache. Because God knows that the more that you know, the more you're held accountable and the more of a burden it is on your shoulders to make sure to make the right decisions. But if God has you at an innocent stage, then God can make sure that your actions are basically innocent, not guilty that he can find you with sins at the judgment, right? That's the idea. So God wanted it that way. Now, one more thing that I want to talk about is that in verse 24 and 25, concerning about marriage. Now, I'm not going to go on a long spiel about this, but I think this is important because there are some people who ask me about this still to this day. Is that basically, so we do realize that marriage, that it is done with man and woman together, one. Number two, we realize that it has to be done legally. But we have to also understand this too, is that like number three, we're not saying that, you know, where you have to wait or halt the process for such a long time because our government system, they make things very complicated nowadays. So I understand that. There are some things that are hard to achieve. So if you're a person who has an interest with this other partner and want to be married together, then the good thing to do is to make sure that you have, uh, that you basically do it in front of the eyes of the church. Why? Because doing it in front of the eyes of the church, at least you preserve your testimony in some way that, hey, these two are gonna get married together and we're familiar with your life and your testimony. By doing that, you can do that together as a church. If you have to do it now, then you can do it together in the church as an eyewitness, as a testimony to the church. That way your testimony is preserved, right? That way people don't think that, oh, you're trying to be illegal or you're trying to just shack up. No, by doing it in the eyes of the church, then we, you, at least you have testimony that, oh, these two are getting married together. And then keep attempting to do legal means to make sure that you get uh, the license and everything. I've done that with one wedding before. So I've done that with one wedding before. Basically, we've done it from the church, and then the process was still not done yet, but it was in process. See, they were still trying. So that is perfectly fine for some of you. Now, look, we don't believe in shacking up together. If you're doing that in the church, then you need to get right with God, and you got to stop that. So it's important that because we believe that we got to abstain from fornication, we, that's serious in the eyes of God. So I know in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's extremely tough, right? It's extremely tough and you can't help it. And then, you know, people are living together and stuff like that. But look, you got to do things done scripturally and God will provide the means and the way out. I know that myself, I've been through a lot of different encounters and experiences like that. If God can do that with what I've seen and witnessed, he can certainly do that with you. So you have to believe and trust in God. So knowing all of this tough logistics, it's hard. So the very least you can do is at least come to me as, uh, 
come to the pastor here and let's do this as a church at least, right? Let's just at least do this as a church. That way your testimony is preserved because coming in, just staying together and giving us the impression that you're not married yet, then we're getting the idea of shacking up. At least give us the impression that you're married together. Okay, let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Oh, my goodness. Stop. All right. All right. I'm sorry. All right. Chapter 3, in comes the serpent. We'll cover that in our next Bible study. God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the teaching of your book. I pray to make us increase and grow in knowledge of the Scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.